I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. You may not have power to change your whole life that you know needs to be changed. But if you surrender to Christ, he'll give you the power. I don't know who I'm going to see. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to be interacting and who I'm going to be acting with. But, but, but God, here's what I want. I want. I want you to do eternal things through my life today. In full confidence that if my God has sent me, he will also equip me for the task at hand. Before you stepped in the doors tonight, before you ever turned to Jesus, before you ever even thought about pursuing a life to live for him, before that, he would make sure you know that before you do any of that, my son died for you, so you have to know that you're loved. Man, is this weekend exciting. If I haven't met you, my name is Dan Smith. I'm the lead pastor here of New Life Church, and this is my gorgeous, beautiful, talented wife, Kelsey Smith. She oversees our worship, and she also oversees our youth ministry uh, that happens on Sunday nights. And so, man, this is an exciting time because we've been in this series called Seven Minute Messages, and people have stepped out in faith to share their stories, their testimonies, to be able to share a word from God to each and every one of us. Man, have you guys gotten something out of this series or what? It's been absolutely incredible. And I can't help but think about a passion point for Kelsey and me personally, as well as for our church. You may not know this, but my degree is actually in elementary education. That's right. Thank kindergarten cop. <laughs> I wish my mom was here. She taught kindergarten for 39 years. But then my wife was also an educator right here in Matawan Middle School. And so, man, we have a passion for young people. Passion for, for passing on the baton of faith to the next generation. We don't even just call them the next generation because right here, right now, they are the now, now generation. generation. And I don't know if you know this. But most of the apostles, the disciples that Jesus interacted with and set up to take on his baton of faith, to carry his mission forward, most of them were teenagers. And so the Bible even says, in, 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 in to David, he says, don't let people look down on you because you're young. That actually might be Paul to Timothy, but nonetheless, it's in the Bible. Um, but anyways, here's the point. Man, these people, these students are incredible young people who have a story from God, they have a history with God, they're going to share their story and share their word for you. And we pray that it would touch you and, and, and God would speak to you exactly in the place where God knows that you need it today. And so in just a moment, you're going to give them a huge, I don't even know, a huge scream, whoop, holler. You're going to interact. Kelsey's going to give you the rules. But man, I am so, can I just say it to your face? I am so proud of you. They look thrilled. Statistics say that, that, that young people are going away from the church. I don't believe it. Look around. Yeah. And, and so, man, if you're a youth, man, get, it, get plugged in to Sunday nights. Man, we have a youth section right here in the front. Come. If you come with your, came with your parents, you can, you can even make your way down here to, to hang out with them and to get to know them. But, man, I'm going to – Tim Brown, what's up? But, man, I'm going to pass it off to my wife so we can get this thing started. Awesome. We are so excited for this week of seven minute messages and I get the honor of introducing every single one of these speakers to you. And like Dan said, these are not the next generation. We believe this is the now generation. We don't have a kids table at New Life Church. I remember one of the most powerful moments in my time here at New Life was, as Dan said, I had been a middle school choir teacher before. And I remember when he said, we're going to plant New Life. And I said, well, I... He said, do you want to be the worship director? And I said, yeah, but I don't know anyone else that does music, so I don't have a team because I'm not going to take people from the church I've been serving at. He was like, well, we'll figure it out. A few years later, maybe two years in, I came to that seat right next to Dan and looked in the whole front line. Four people leading worship were all students I had had in middle school choir. And it was like God was saying, while you were teaching them, I was preparing your worship team. So they're here, and Aaron Green, who's going to speak first was in my first ever seventh grade choir class. 
So that's pretty cool. Secret about Aaron, I have a fun fact for each one of them for you. Because I think that's really fun. Aaron has a younger sister, Lindsay, and they have no brothers. And so her dad, wanting them to have a diverse home that felt like there were boys too, bought them a tool bench, right, for them to play with. And Aaron says it was never once used as a tool bench, only a kitchen and a baby changing table. That's Aaron's fun fact. Dan's like, I can definitely relate to that. Mason, here, this is Mason. He's gonna be a junior. A junior at Madawan High School. Mason plays football. And he wants you to know that he can squat 405 pounds. Yes, yes. I tried to send a video to Mason once of me squatting. Not 405 pounds, because I was squatting Dan. But I fell over. I got down, and then I was like, ah, and just tipped. So Mason, you win. This, coming down to this side now, this is Parker Martin. <laughs> Parker started coming to New Life when we were at the Fetzer Center. And I remember Parker because he was the first one there, standing with his Bible, ready to get in to the worship center. And I thought, man, it's like, what, what were you, freshman in high college? I mean, freshman in college. And I was like, I want what this kid has. This kid has some fire for the house of God. And he's been coming ever since. He now serves in our kids' ministry. <laughs> May May calls him Marker because she thinks it's funny, Marker instead of Parker. But his fun fact, and I'm going to see if he can prove it later. He said he used to be able to walk on his hands. And he said he doesn't know if he can now, so what greater time to try than in his seven minutes? Yeah, see? And this, oh, and Parker just recently graduated from Western Michigan University. Yes. And this right here is Miss Lily Walters. Your fans. Lily is going to be a sophomore at Madawan High School. I can't imagine myself as a sophomore going right there. So I don't want you to think, oh, this is the young adults one, or this is the, this is the youth one. I probably, you know, can check out for a little while because I'm further in my faith. <laughs> I promise you there's a lot to learn from these students, and they teach me stuff every day. So I want you to open your ears, open your hearts, and believe that God gave them a word to give to you this morning. <laughs> Lily's fun fact is that she was born 10 weeks early. And look at her. 10 weeks early. That's great. She's a miracle baby. All right. Here's the rules for you guys. They have seven minutes. You can cheer. People love some good feedback. So like, that's good, Aaron Green. Oh, speak to me, Parker. Yes, that is good. You can clap. If the buzzer goes, because they will get buzzed at seven minutes, you have the choice to either say, that's good. Keep on going. Or, bye. <laughs> Not really, not really. You'll say, that's good, keep on going. And then we're going to give them a round of applause and celebrate them being so bold in their faith to stand up on this stage. So without further ado, Miss Erin Green's kicking us off. Awesome. All right, so when I was first asked to speak today, my initial thought was no. Absolutely not, immediately no. You can put me on stage to worship every week, but I will not be speaking. However, that's exactly why I said yes to today. Um, and even taking that a step further, as I typed out Y-E-S with my eyes closed and hit send, um, I still wasn't trusting God with the purpose for why I'm speaking today. Question by question and doubt by doubt began to creep into my mind. The big one being, well, what the heck am I supposed to talk about? And God stepped in in that moment, and he said, are you stupid? Trust me. Now, he really didn't say the stupid part, but that's for sure how I felt. And I realized in that moment that I wasn't trusting God. I was listening to the lies of the enemy. And right then, I knew my topic for today. Today, I'm going to be talking to you all about trust. And I'm going to start this back off when I was a little girl, and I know what you're thinking. She has seven minutes, and she's going all the way back to childhood. Yep, I am, but don't worry, I'll move quickly. 
So back when I was little, I had dreams, didn't we all? What did you dream about when you were a kid? Maybe a future job, a future spouse, maybe future kids you might have, or a hobby that you wanted to make a career. I had hopes and plans for what my future would look like one day. I played dolls in hope of being a mom one day. I wore my mom's heels and put her veil on in hopes of being that beautiful bride someday myself. I set up an easel in my basement and forced my sister to be the student in my little classroom. And I sang Taylor Swift and worship music in my karaoke machine in my basement. But just as I hoped and dreamed for myself, God had bigger hopes and better dreams for me than I could have ever imagined for myself. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I believe God invites us to dream as long as we are trusting him in those dreams. I did a life group a couple semesters ago that studied the book of Daniel, and Daniel was gifted the understanding of dreams and visions of all kinds, as stated in Daniel 1.17. And we all know the story of Daniel and the lions then, right? Of how God shut the mouths of all the lions and Daniel walked out alive. But even before the den, Daniel trusted the Lord and was obedient. He requested vegetables and water over the royal food that the king ordered everybody to eat. And after those 10 days, he was the healthiest amongst all the men who had eaten the king's best. He trusted and pleaded with God for the explanation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, and they were revealed to him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God would deliver them from that fiery furnace, and they came out of the fire. The guards saw a fourth shadow walking amongst that fire with them that they believed to be the son of God. Are you trusting that amidst your dreams, amidst fires that you have for yourself, that God is in them with you? I want you to put yourself in Daniel's shoes just for a minute. What if you were told to drop everything and worship gold every time you heard the sound of music or you'd be thrown into that fiery furnace? Or maybe if you were told for 30 days you weren't allowed to pray or worship or you'd be thrown into a pit with lions. Would you do it? Would you be obedient? I can tell you that I would be seriously weighing my options, and I came up with three. One, I would listen to the law, but go against what God tells me to do, but I know for a fact I would survive. Two, I break the law, obey God, but living in fear and anxiousness of what comes next. And three, I break the law, obey God, and trust wholeheartedly that he will deliver and follow through with his plan for me. So which one are you? Are you number one, maybe holding on to that dream so tightly that you aren't trusting God with it? Because I've been there. Are you two, maybe you're stepping out in obedience, but holding on to 5% of control because you're scared. If you let that little bit go, you might be scared of what happens next. Because if I'm being honest, that's where I sit most of the time. Or are you three? Are you trusting him wholeheartedly, stepping out in obedience because you know his plan is greater than anything that we could dream for ourselves? Because that's where I want to be, and I want you to be there with me. So I'm in school right now, and I'm pursuing my um, dream that I have of becoming a teacher. And I have the privilege of standing up here on stage on Sunday mornings leading you all in worship but would it surprise you if I told you that I was actually terrified of the idea of singing in front of everybody? That was my fiery furnace. I quite literally had a fear of microphones because people would be able to single out and hear only my voice. But one Sunday, I was serving in kids ministry, and Kelsey came up to me saying, hey, someone on the worship team's sick, and we need you to fill in for her. And I said, okay. I didn't really have a choice to say no when she asked me on Sunday morning. Um, but what I did have a choice in was trusting God, to trust that he would come up with me onto this platform and to trust his purpose for why I was up here. I can honestly say I wasn't nervous that Sunday because I was worshiping for an audience of one. I trusted that God would use the gifts that he gave me for good in somewhere and in some way. Now, my mom always told me growing up that God will either fulfill the desires of your heart or he will take them away. 
in his timing and in his way. And that's the part for, that's hard for us to hear sometimes. But there are still dreams that I have that haven't yet come true. I talked about ones that have. Fires that I still have to walk into and through and still will. But if I've seen God fulfill my dreams before, how come it's so hard to trust that he'll do it again? I mentioned earlier how I would dress up as a bride when I was a little in my mom's shoes and her veil. And that little girl wearing that veil and those heels is still staring back at me in the mirror today. But the reflection looking back at me looks a little different now. When I look in the reflection in the mirror, I still see that little girl in the veil. I still see that dream. But when I look in the mirror, I see two reflections, mine and God's. And I know that as long <laughs> I know that as long as I see those two reflections with me that he is walking through that fire with me I can trust his if and his when trust isn't easy it's earned but God earned our trust when he sent his son to save us he earned our trust when he sent the rainbow after the flood and he earned our trust when he delivered Daniel from the lion's den and Shadrach Meshach and Abednego from that furnace Yes, trust can be broken, but I promise you that God never broke your trust. You stopped trusting him. So what dreams are you holding on to? What fire are you walking around in without trusting that he's that fourth person in that fire with you? Maybe you're not trusting when they're going to happen or how they're going to happen. I can promise you that God's dreams for you are better than your own. And I encourage you to trust him in the process. Thank you. Come on. All right, I want to talk to you guys about something I think we all have in common in some way. Distraction. Luke chapter 10 points out how Martha was too distracted by worldly things. She wanted the house to smell good, look pretty, and, pre and be presented perfectly for Jesus. While she, was being, while she was busy doing all the things she thought was important, Mary was at the feet of Jesus worshiping him, listening to everything he had to say. Then Martha got all upset. She criticized Mary, and Jesus said, hey, she's doing what's important. See, Jesus knew the world would always be full of distractions. They would always prevent us from seeing him. So I think it was important that this story was in the Bible to remind us to keep focused on him. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Martha reminds me of myself and other teens in the world. Teens spend five hours a day looking at social media and other things on their phone. We are so worried about our followers or how many likes we get or comments. We spend so many times just looking at people's highlight reels and comparing it to our reality. We start to feel condemned like we can't measure up or achieve what we or achieve what our social media friends have. Just like Martha, we are too worried about what is not important instead of focusing on the one thing that matters, God. Almost daily, people say I don't have time or I'm way too busy. But then we turn around and spend hours scrolling through posts, watching movies, watching our favorite TV series or playing our favorite video game. It isn't that we don't have time. We make time for what we value and we t and we find time for what we think is fun. So I started thinking why is it so easy for us to Facebook and so hard for us to put our face in the book? For me, social media has been one of the biggest distractions in my life. It started gaming on a family member's tablet, and I was distracted by a message that came across the screen. At seven years old, I decided to open the message, and I found myself looking at a pornographic image for the first time. I did not really understand what exactly I saw or how it would affect me over the next nine years. I've struggled with this small distraction that brought mass destruction to my life ever since. You see, after the first image, I found myself wanting to see more than not wanting to see it and looking for it anyways. It led to broken trust and relationships, to living in guilt and fear. <laughs> and to me feeling like there was nothing I could do to stop. They're, they're, like, this is just who I was. When I went to the Axis Conference, I decided to go all in to see what God had to say to me. I went unsure of how much Jesus I actually wanted in my life. In fact, a month before we left, I told my mom I would never be one of those hand-raising, oh, Jesus type of people. 
But God gave me an image, an image that was not the liar, broken, addicted person I had given into. God showed me that I was loved. He showed me that he had a plan for my life. God showed me a picture of myself on a stage, praising him and speaking about him to others. At first, I was like, nope, that is not me. I did not think I actually saw that. Like, maybe I just created the thought myself. Then, the pastor that night, Jobin Chavez, made a call to the altar for people that saw themselves in full-time ministry. I was like, oh boy, I have to go. And yes, Mom, I came back as one of those hand-raising, oh Jesus type of people. God urged me to delete social media. I was using to feed my addiction. That is not who I am, and if I wanted to be the person God created me to be, I had to give up certain things that take me away from his path. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is, not too common, or that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will never let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. You see, God showed me that I can stop, that he will help me. I have his word and need to spend time with him every day. I have great youth leaders that, call, that I can call any time I need prayer or help. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. See, you got to spend time with Jesus every single day. I need to read by my, read my Bible every single day. What distraction is God urging you to lay down? Does social media feel, leave you feeling motivated or inferior? Are you finding yourself, are you finding your standard of life in the word of God or from your favorite influencer? Are you basing your decisions on what God says about you or what the world says? Because I know God sees far more in me than what the world showed me, and he can do the same for you. Boy, well, I got a lot of time left. <laughs> That's what I should have done. Look at some hydration. You want your notes? I get parched up here. Yep, I should grab my notes. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. It's a lot scarier than I thought it was going to be. So I have the opportunity up here to talk about life change from being a part of kids' ministry. So to start talking about that, I'm going to read Matthew 18, 1 through 5, and I'm going to read verse 6 later. So here we go. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to focus on verse 5 here. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So, that is the most profound and the most perfect way to explain what it is from the standpoint of someone who gets to teach and minister to children. <clears throat> so I got into kids' ministry in a little bit of an odd way. Um, I was serving in other places of the church, and I always told myself, and I told everyone, I'm just going to go where I'm needed. Wherever the church needs me, I'm going to go. The second someone would bring up kids' ministry, I would sweep it away, look the other way, go like, no, that's not me. And after a few years, I got a couple pokes from some of my friends in the church, and I got a couple pokes from God. And eventually I was like, all right, you know what? I'll do it. I think I actually said I'm not against it. And eventually I got put on a schedule, and I was there. So I very quickly realized this is where I need to be. This is all in. This is what God had for me. And there's a couple different areas of life change that I saw immediately and that I've saw over the last year and a half that I've gotten to teach your guys' kids. So the first area of life change is that these kids are giving their lives to Christ. And not only are they just giving their lives to Christ, they are registering to be baptized to publicly proclaim to the world that they gave their lives to Christ. So I wanted to make that point early because if I mess this whole rest of this thing up and we can go home today knowing that kids are giving their lives to Christ and that they are being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I think we can walk away with a win. So, the next area I want to talk about is a little bit more about myself, and I'm going to read verse 6. So verse 6 says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Yikes. That's, that's a little bit scary. So 
when I was coming in early into kids' ministry and I was building relationships with these kids and trying to teach them, that verse paralyzed me. So it motivated me to do things in a way that wasn't only going to not cause them to stumble, but to prevent them from stumbling later on. So that forced me to know the word that I'm teaching these kids, to pray for the kids, to pray for myself, and to pray for the messages and the lessons that we have prepared. So with that, the life change that happens to me is that I'm talking to God more. I'm reading more of his word. And that's not just related to kids' ministry. That's going to go everywhere I go in my life. It doesn't matter what stories it could be. It could be Jonah and the whale. It could be David throwing the rock. Everything. Everything relates to our life. So the last area I want to talk about is having a childlike faith. So I learn that from these kids every week. So every week we make, I try to make a plan that whatever we teach, I want these kids to take something. Something that they can put in their head that one day when they're, whether they're kids, middle school, high school, college, career, husbands, wives, fathers, daughters, children, whatever. That they have something that when the enemy comes knocking, and he is going to come knocking, that they can have in their arsenal to use against him. But the thing is, these kids always don't want to hear what we have to say. They don't, they don't want to go to worship. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't, they don't want to play the games that we have. They want to jump off the walls. They want to play their games. They want to do whatever they want to do. But if they can leave here with one thing, and that thing is knowing that they are loved by their Father in heaven, everything else can fall into place. That it doesn't, maybe we want them to know the word, but if they don't know the whole word now, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe we just need to get that one step and let God carry through the rest. So the last thing I'm going to say here today, I moved a little bit faster than I thought, (laughs) was that God created the future world changers and the leaders of the future, and they're in the cafeteria right now. And we have the blessing and the opportunity to watch it and be a part of God's masterpiece every week. And you guys have some great kids, and that's all I got for you guys today. (laughs) Good morning, New Life. I'm going to talk to you today about blessings and how they come in all different sizes and in many different ways. Blessings are defined as a favor or gift bestowed upon you by God, thereby bringing you happiness. The happiness from certain blessings is not always promised instantly, but will come in time. God's timing is never by accident. He knows when you are ready to receive certain blessings and when you are not. One of my favorite Bible verses, Isaiah 60.22, says, When the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. The same thing goes for when you're praying for a big blessing that you've had your mind so set on that you overlook all the small blessings God has given you. Whenever God says yes or no or wait, he knows he has a plan for you and will always provide in the end. Imagine you are running late for work and get stuck in traffic. Eventually, you get to work and you find out that there was a crash at the same time you were supposed to cross that intersection. It was obviously a bummer that you were late to work, but it was a blessing in disguise because in the end, God saved you. Each and every day, God wakes you up for a reason. He is not done with you, he, which is a blessing within itself. He wants to teach you and bless you more. Put all your trust in him, and he will make your path straight. In Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in him. In the same way, little blessings can eventually lead you to bigger blessings. An example from my own life is getting closer to one of my friends from elementary school, Gracie, who introduced me to one of her close friends, Carly, which led me into another close friendship with one of her friends, Allison. Eventually, all that led me is to this church, where I was able to meet many amazing people and grow deeper in my relationship with God. With that being said, you don't always need a chain of small blessings to bring you to bigger blessings. My family and I were in a time of tribulation, bouncing from hotel room to car and being physically and verbally abused by a man who thought himself a father. I ached for myself that I had to go through this, but it hurt me more than anything to watch my mom and little brother go through the same thing. Then, one summer day when I was eight, God gave me one of the biggest blessings of my life, 
what I like to call my second family. They gave me a home when I felt homeless. I've lived with my second family off and on since I was eight, and they've helped raise me in the best way possible. <laughs> um. <laughs> God put this family in my life for a reason, and I didn't see it as a blessing then, but everything that they have done for me in the years that I've known them, I look back on now and see just how big of a blessing it was and still is for me. Being there for others and being a person who mothers can talk to and trust in is one out of many ways you can be a blessing to others. Because I know I have a few of those people, and I'm so thankful for each and every one of them. This past month, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Axis and serve a community called Orange Mount. Some of the people here today and I helped that community by picking up trash along its streets and sticks in, 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 a, in the town's prayer garden. I was filled with joy to know that I was helping not just one person, but a community. It was a blessing to me, Orange Mount, its residents, and to the Lord. In Luke 6.38, it says, if you bless others, the blessing will come to you. All in all, helping others can help, you, can help you and bless you. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, what is the power of a blessing? The blessing is a supernatural force that drives a man into the center of God's will, plan, or destiny for you. Sometimes I think about when God blessed me with my second family. Why me? Why was I able to escape the abuse my mom and brother still had to live through it? Why couldn't my family take care of me the way my second family could? But then I will always look back on what I said earlier. God had a plan for me and has a plan for you. And nothing is a coincidence in that plan. Nothing. For instance, you will not miss the people you are supposed to meet, and you will not meet the people you are supposed to miss. Because God put every person in your life for a reason. That reason could be to teach you, to help you grow, to laugh with you, to cry with you, to talk to you, or even to bless you. If you have been blessed, you feel lucky to have something. Maybe it's health or talents or even that people you are surrounded by. Regardless of what God gives you, they can all be considered blessings. So take time and look back on your life and see all the things God has given you because you will realize that you have been blessed way more than you could ever think possible. But maybe you are in what seems to be a hopeless situation today, and if so, ask God to show you his blessing in it because he will. Or maybe you feel like you've been blessed beyond belief. If so, how are you using that to bless others? James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from God. This life may be rain, but God will always bring a rainbow at the end of the storm. Thank you. That was incredible. Can we give them one more round of applause as they head back to their seats?